Hi friends, welcome back. Happy Monday, if there is such a thing, and I'm so glad that you are joining us for another episode of Something's Happening Here. This week, our episode is going to be called Worse Than Watergate. So it's going to be a fun episode, and, and we're not going to just talk about Richard Nixon the whole time, but uh, that we'll, we will follow that line of thinking uh, in a number of different ways. So to make sure that you follow everything we need to say this week, your job is to make sure you are subscribed. Um, that means to hit your, bu your button or your bell, or if you're on Facebook, uh, then you need, to be, you need to like the page or be a follower of the page and set your video notifications to get what we publish. So um, again, thank you for being here, and let us get right to it. Worse than Watergate. And if you have been living in the United States of America for the past 10 years, 15 years or so, um, this is a phrase I'm sure you have heard probably kind of a lot because it is used kind of a lot in, uh, in our news entertainment industry. You like how I did that? It's not the news industry. It's not the entertainment industry. It's the news entertainment industry. It's the infotainment industry. Um, they're quick with these comparisons. And so another very common comparison is worse than Hitler, right? And our, everybody's a Hitler, everybody's a Nazi. Um, it's very kind of hyperbolic language that is designed to be emotional at its core, to, to almost to overrule our brain's ability to rationally process the information and go straight to the heart, where um, where, you know, the reason that I get to skip over all the rational stuff is because there is no rational way to respond to Hitler, right? There is no rational way to respond to that level of evil. The only choice is to go get your gun and invade Germany and go kill him, right? So if I want you to adopt a certain position on something, the easiest way to do that is not to make a rational argument, but to argue to your heart, Right? It's to inflame your heart with passion about how evil the alternative would be, and therefore it leaves you really no choice but to do the thing that's not Hitler. Or in this case, to do the thing that's not worse than Watergate. So I want to start by looking at an article from Politico, because this one is from 2018. It's not very current, but it gets to the heart of what I'm saying. This was kind of um, not a satire article, but it was kind of tongue in cheek because it's 46 political scandals that were, and then in quotes, worse than Watergate. The subtitle you may see there is The Brief History of a Shop Worn Cliche That Deserves to Die. So, really, the, the whole kind of premise of this article is saying we're using this phrase so much that it doesn't mean anything anymore. And, and, and the article is pointing out one after another, after another, after another for the purpose of like, I, I don't even think the author really expects you to read all the way through it because by the time you get to what, number six, seven, eight, nine, you're like, oh, this is the same thing. <laughs> this, it is or is not worse than Watergate. I mean, that's up to you to decide. But the very fact that the same label gets applied to so many different things should let you know that there's something happening here, right? Something a little bit more profound underneath the surface. So let's, um, let's get some examples here of things that are worse than Watergate. Uh, way back in the first one in the list, April 30, 1973, when Senator Barry Goldwater uh, had some <laughs> had some commentary on this. Uh, how in the world do you say that? Uh, Chappaquiddick, is that right? Chappaquiddick. <laughs> I think the country short sure as hell forgot about Chappaquiddick in a hurry, and I think that's worse than Watergate. Yikes! And then it goes on from there. You see, May six seventy three, May nine seventy three, um, <laughs> December twenty four seventy three. So it's like right away, that was all automatically the kind of overused, overblown phrase in the political realm. And it didn't stop there. Took a little break, apparently, from 1980 to 87. But once we've got the Iran-Contra situation, 
In 1987, this scandal is substantively far more serious than Watergate, potentially much more damaging to the country, and growing worse all the time. When it is done, even if no one goes to jail, this may actually make Watergate look like the mere third-rate burglary that Richard Nixon once said it was. So, I gotta ask you, friends, if all of these things are truly worse than Watergate, then why is that still the phrase? Like, if, if Iran Contra was worse than Watergate, then why is every scandal that follows that not worse than Iran Contra? Right? The very fact that we keep reaching 50 years into the past for our, our, um, for our comparison there should let you know that probably the comparison itself is flawed. And lo and behold, I mean, we can scroll all the way down. We see that this takes, um, it's, it's a bipartisan cliche. We've got um, commentary here from June 27, uh, 2007. Uh, criticism against the George Bush era warrantless wiretapping. That's worse than Watergate, says Ger Representative Jerry Nadler. Um, a few years later in 2011, uh, commentary, commentator Ben Shapiro uh, talking about Obama era wiretapping of the Israeli embassy. Let me get this straight. We can't wiretap terrorists, but we wiretap allies. Worse than Watergate. And it goes back and forth. You see a lot of worse than Watergate levied against President Obama. Um, uh, indirectly, like with Solyndra in 2011, and more directly, like in 2012, about the, the birth certificate thing, and on and on and on. And then, of course, to no one's surprise, once you get to 2016, it's all about Donald Trump, right? Every, everything that he did is worse than Watergate, on and on and on and on and on and on. So what's the point of all this? The point is that this is clearly... It, um, the words don't mean anything anymore. So even after we get through all 40-odd of these examples that terminate in 2018, and Politico's point is to show you how ridiculous it is to keep saying this over and over, nonetheless, here's an Atlantic article from just the following year, I believe, 2019, where Donald Trump is worse than Watergate again, if the multiple charges against Trump prove out, he'll easily displace Nixon at the top of the crooked modern president's list. So even Politico's attempt to kind of um, satire this phrase out of existence didn't work. And to this day, everything is still worse than Watergate. So what's really happening here? Similarly to the idea, there's a, there's a marketing adage that if you market to everyone, you're really marketing to no one. Similarly here, if everything is worse than Watergate, then like nothing's worse than Watergate, really, right? That, that phrase doesn't mean anything. It's disconnected from any actual measurable meaning. So why is this so popular? If... <laughs> It's, it's been overused by the left and the right. It's been overused by every media outlet under the sun, I'm sure. It's been satirized, but it's still popular. Why? If everybody knows it's ridiculous and we keep doing it anyway, what is even the purpose? And I'll tell you why. I believe it's actually intentional to remove any and all meaning, uh, not even from this phrase. I, th I think the phrase itself is designed to remove any and all meaning from the events that they are discussing, right? Again, it goes straight to that emotional core because if uh, what President Obama is doing is worse than Watergate, well, then it, I don't need to think about it because Watergate was terrible. And if this is worse, then, then this must be terrible too. And I don't need to really investigate anything at all, right? I, I can just default to, oh, it must be terrible. And same thing with President Trump. If what he's doing makes him the most corrupt president of all time, worse than Watergate, worse than Richard Nixon, well, then I don't really need to think about that, do I? Because Nixon was bad, Trump is worse. Therefore, Trump is bad, right? I don't need to investigate at all. And the danger in doing that is that 
there are actually things that are worse than Watergate, aren't there? Of course, even from Politico's list, I, I dare say a fair number of the things on that list are probably objectively worse, more illegal, more damaging than anything that happened at or surrounding Watergate. But when that thing comes, and you see it already from the political list, when these big deal things come, and we just go straight to the trope of worse than Watergate, we disconnect our thinking, and it's like, we, we miss the real danger of it. Let's just say, I mean, let's just say, and this is a hypothetical, but let's say the next president after President Biden is actually a real, like, violent dictator. Somehow such a person gets into the office and he poses a real threat to real people in the real world, right? It worse, like, objectively worse than any American president to date. Well, is anyone going to take that seriously when the media just go to the same old tried and true and worn out trope of worse than Watergate? Well, why, why should I really evaluate this new danger as anything bigger or worse than the previous three dozen things that they told me were worse than Watergate, but we lived through them anyway? And there's a prophetic problem coming as well. Why we need to disengage from this media nonsense and keep our eyes open on purpose. So if you've got your Bibles, please join me in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Um, we're going to go to chapter 11. I'm going to spend a lot of time in Daniel chapter 11 over the course of something's happening here, because um, I think actually this chapter is very important for our specific moment in time right now. But at the end of that chapter, there is a conflict and that conflict is said to be the final conflict on earth prior to the return of Jesus Christ. So if we can read about it in verse 40, Daniel 11, verse 40, we're going to see two characters here. They're both called kings. One is of the south, one is of the north. Um, and the specific identities of those are not really important for this discussion. I personally believe they actually re refer more to ideas and spirits than they do to specific people or entities. But nonetheless, there is a conflict between these two characters. One of, those king of, one of them is the king of the south, and he goes on a rampage. And he is causing mayhem, and uh, it, it just says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, meaning the king of the north. All right, and it's the nature of that attack is not explained in the text, but it's of such a bad enough attack that the verse continues by saying, and the king of the north shall come against him, the king of the south, like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. So what we're seeing is that there is a proportional disconnect between the attack that the king of the south launched and the counter attack that the king of the north um, issues in return. Because the king of the south's attack, as terrible as it was, comes to an end. He's defeated and, and goes away. But the king of the north becomes such a dominant, massive power all across planet earth that he is the one in charge when Jesus comes. If you continue to read to the end of the chapter, the king of the south disappears. There is no king of the south. The king of the north becomes so massive, he has no enemies. No one can stand against him except Jesus himself. And quickly, we see a similar thing in Revelation 13. Um, when we are given to read about a beast that rises from the sea, and that is Revelation's version of that same King of the North problem from Daniel 11. It's this massive governmental religious power that is just dominant everywhere. And I'd like to read verse 4. They are the people of the earth. They worship the dragon who gave authority to this beast, and they worship the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? 
do you hear the element of surprise in that? They're surprised. They're surprised because their media and their world told them that everything was equally dangerous. And the rise of the king of the north or the beast from the sea is worse than Watergate, just like everything else. And so if I survived all that other stuff, why should I pay any special attention here? I hope you see the problem that we're facing here and why we have to disconnect from this media narrative before it takes us down. We're going to build on that idea as we go forward th throughout the week and try to figure out what truly is worse than Watergate and maybe what is not as we uh, look for Jesus in these last days. So join us again tomorrow at the same time in the same place as we continue this discussion. I'm Steve Hicks. This is Something's Happening Here. And may God bless you until we meet again. Thank you.